there's literally zero reason for anybody to listen to that show unless they know you if all they see is the John Doe show and your photo. What are those places that you can invest a lot of your energy, resources, creativity to hook mm -hmm. people right with your concept with your idea right so then people when they tune into that they're like "Ooh, this sounds interesting and then they go and dive deeper into your world it's actually a pretty low bar is like making sure that from the title and cover art people your, your ideal listeners understand that this is at least for them this is what you can expect right but guess what there's all the vehicles that we can present your content mm -hmm. to people inside of your company to people that are already clients of, of yours can we involve them into the creation process so you can foster those relationships oh the big shows are doing this so i should do that when you have to kind of realize they have a totally different business model than many small shows have what are your thoughts on personality imbued into the podcast creation process you know one of the big challenges with podcasting is always been the lack of we've got hey i'm luis and this is fonzie and welcome to the content is profit podcast in here you're gonna get the insights accountability and drive to create consistently and increase revenue you'll hear from top entrepreneurs creators and anything and everything you need to know about content all this for having a good time the goal of this podcast is simple entertain educate and turn your content into profit let's go yee -yee. what's up uh I'm excited about today. I'm here to learn today. Yeah. I've been uh, pretty behind the scenes with a couple other things and uh, yeah. we put this episode together, man. Quick quick context on this conversation yes. <laughs> or awesome friend Carly from the Hospital Podcast Network. She shared with us that her other good friend that is here today <laughs> with us had released an incredible trends report for podcasters, marketing trends for podcasters in 2023. Mm -hmm. And when I took a look at that, I was like, we need to bring him back on the show. The work that was done to put this together is absolutely amazing. The report is incredible. We'll definitely share the report. If you want to take a look at it, just scroll down on the description. We're going to have the link right there for you. Um, so without further ado, please welcome the one and only Jeremy Enns. What's up, Jeremy? Hey, Luis Fonzi. So good to be back on the show. Great to, to chat as always. Oh, yeah, Jeremy. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. You and I had a previous conversation kind of like going over that report that you put together, which, again, is absolutely amazing. The amount of work that went into it, man. Uh, thank you from the whole podcasting community, first of all. <laughs> and you have some clear takeaways, right, that uh, kind of like came out through uh, came came out through all that work that you did so before you share those kind of like main takeaways share a little bit about what inspired you to first create that research like put the work for that research and uh share with me that little kind of like timeline yeah. on what took to complete this yeah. thing because it was Jeremy, mind blowing before before you you answer that question i want to encourage everybody that this is not only for podcasting of course podcasting is the main vehicle but there's going to be lessons and frameworks right that we might be able to use in other types of content right so we know that we have people that listen for all the reasons obviously podcasting is like the main one in our channel but look at it through an eye of like, how can I take this from this industry and then apply it to whatever content you are producing? So I just want to put that little asterisk in there because uh, the information that we're about to share is amazing. Go ahead, Jeremy. <laughs> yeah, so um, I have been, as a creator and marketer and business owner, rely on data in a lot of places. And I'm one of those kind of nerds who actually likes going through data and loves the numbers. I know not, not everybody is, is that way, but I certainly am. and you know, one of the big challenges with podcasting has always been the lack of kind of public transparent data. And so you can like go and look at another YouTuber's channel and you can see like, oh, they grew from, you know, 5,000 to 50,000 subscribers over the past six months. And that might be a clue for you to say like, oh, maybe I should look at what they're doing and see, you know, can I emulate some of that and apply it to my own channel? Whereas with podcasting, like nobody really knows how many downloads anybody else has. And yeah. I think most podcast creators tend to think everybody's doing way better than them. And a lot of people like you're looking at these people who seem like they're doing a really great job of the show. And so you're like, oh, I'm going to copy their social media strategy or whatever. But you don't really know if what they're yeah. doing is working. And so for me, I was like, OK, this is it's really frustrating as a, a creator to be able to not understand who's actually doing well, who should I be emulating, who should I be ignoring? And so that was kind of the big reason for me. And then one of the other things was just kind of from a benchmark perspective of, you know, I've had a production agency for a long time and now work with people on the marketing side of things. And I was always just curious. I would collect data from my own clients and students and just kind of see like, what is the 
typical month over month growth rate that sh- somebody should be aspiring to, or like, you know, what is good essentially? Cause nobody okay. really knows. And so I had like a small kind of set of data, but kind of each one of these uh, market or not marketing reports, but reports in the podcasting industry, there's been more and more of them in the past few years. And I would like go through them and every time I would get excited about them, I'd read through the data and then I'd just be at the end like, what do I, is there anything here I can actually like do with this? (laughs) What's the conclusion, right? Really? It's like, really? Yeah. And there was like like a lot of stuff. And to be fair, a lot of these reports are more aimed at advertisers and they were about like, kind of like listeners who are, who are the listeners who listen to podcasts. I was like, well, that doesn't really help me as a creator do anything. And so finally I was just like, wait a minute, I think I could just do this myself. And I was initially just going to do it for my like existing hundred people in my membership community. And it was then like, actually, if I'm putting this survey together anyway, like probably I could loop in a bunch more people and yeah. get a lot more uh, responses. For Dude, the report. I, I love this. Just yesterday, uh, I had, while well, you talk about perspective on, you know, how you might model your content or your strategy on other people, right? Um, I'm not going to say who it is, but here's the post. Uh, this year, my podcast hit a hundred... Never mind. I read it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but, okay. Wait, wait, wait. wait. <laughs> say, for, wait, before reading this, I say was what you- very tired last night. Say what I you thought, thought you read. Okay, okay. I'm what I, what I thought I read, okay. and I even screenshot it, right? Okay. So what I thought I read is like, this year we surpassed 100,000 downloads, right? And, and then they go into the lessons of it, right? And I'm like, in my head, it's 100,000 downloads, right? This is 9 p.m., it's been a very long week. And I'm thinking about, wow, like the, what you just said, like we we admire this person, we thought about this. I mean, the core thought of it is very similar, but, uh, and I'm like, this is crazy. Like we got to that number, you know, earlier in the year. Like, I don't even, like we don't track downloads right now. We're like, the way we do this for the relationship, right? But we did, and we're like, wow, this is crazy. Like that that person is actually 100,000. Well, what did, I just- Did you miss three zeros? <laughs> I missed three zeros. I'm on the middle of downloads. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, but the lesson's there, right? Because like, we, we don't really know, obviously that like, that person, I was like very confused. I'm like, yeah. she's a very big person. Man, you you literally missed the mark for a thousand percent. <laughs> but, I mean, I was so tired last night, but anyways, uh, don't consume content at like 1, p- 1 a.m. Uh, uh, but you know, it's, it's, it's often where we see, especially like, hey, they might be doing X and then we assume that that's the strategy that works, but they might be testing something, right? Like, you know, we have yeah. the example of the micro clipping with uh, Alex Hormozzi and his famous captions, right? And mm-hmm. everybody's like, I want the Alex Hormozzi captions. It's not about the captions, guys. It's about something else, right? And, uh, but anyways, funny story. Okay, here we yeah. go. So, yes, we'll do a great clip. Jeremy, it was, um, <laughs> yeah, that was pretty funny. That was pretty funny. We definitely, we definitely need to highlight this moment. Jeremy, you mentioned to me that when you first started doing this research, you put a, a timeline on it, right? And you're like, I'm going to release this by March 2023. And then yeah. you released it in November 2023. And, you know, before, again, before we go into the top lessons that you got from this report and from doing this study, I just want to highlight first the dedication. Because, like, from March to November, it's a very long time to easily get this courage quit the project, just put it aside, right? And sometimes we tackle these big, big projects. And I would argue probably that more often than not, people just, you know, put them on the side and don't finish them. And I'm curious, man, what what drove you to finish this, right? Like what made you complete this report and share it with everybody? Yeah, um, I don't know that I actually have a specific answer to that question because it kind of feels like I, I was within like minutes of, of giving up on it multiple times where I was like, <laughs> just, I had the thought in my mind. I was like, okay, yeah. I think I'm just shelving this thing. Like it's just not worth pushing through. And I don't know what changed. I think then I would like have a, a weekend where like, so essentially what happened, like I, I did all the research, got all the responses early in the year and was intending to release the report, uh, April, May, something like that. I think it was May. And as you know, I kind of expected, like there's a good chance that it will take a bit longer to get all the data processed. This was my first time doing this. I worked with a data biz person. And so like collaborating with them, I kind of went in not really knowing what the, the procedure would look like. And so I was kind of like, this could take longer than I was thinking, but I would really like to get it done by this point. And part of the reason was that I had a launch coming up 
like two weeks later. And so mm-hmm. I was kind of like, this could work out really nicely where I could like get a bunch of exposure and get this report out there, have a bunch of visibility. And then I'm going to be doing this launch for my program. And this could all work really nicely together. Yeah. And of course, then like the report gets pushed. It doesn't get done in time. The launch happens. And then the next, you know, two months are essentially kind of running the cohort, doing all that kind of like launch follow up. And so now we're getting into the summer and then there's, you know, you know, summer stuff like traveling, yeah. visiting friends and family, all this kind of stuff. And it just got pushed and pushed and pushed down the road. Yeah. And I think like coming back into September, I was kind of like, OK, I if I can't get this done by the end of the year, there's no point publishing it. If I can't get it done by December, like I think that's too late. It's getting into the holidays. So I was kind of like I'd really wanted to get it done kind of in September, October was my initial plan. Yeah. And then. I, I kind of, my schedule eased up a little bit and I was like, okay, maybe this is doable. But then I think I did another launch in there. So I had a bunch more like client stuff to, to, to do work with people. So it kind of just kept getting pushed. Yeah. And at some point I think it was mid November and I was like, okay, my schedule's finally clear. I'm just going to like only think about this on the weekends. And I was, I, I know myself where it's like, where at the stage I was at, I was like, really what I need to do is build the website. Yeah. And it's like, it's a pretty designy website and I'm a pretty good website uh, designer and builder at this point. And I was just thinking about this and I was like, Oh man, this is uh, this is a lot of work to put into this. It feels <laughs> like I'm really close to the finish line, but I know I'm not. And so I was just kind of at this point where I was like, is this worth spending? Mm. I don't know, like dozens of hours putting this website yeah. together, maybe 20 or 40 or 60 hours. And I was like, eh, is it really going to be worth it? And at this point I'd sunk so much cost into it that I was just like, I don't, I don't know. You kind of sour on a little bit and you forget yeah. like what inspired you in the first place. Yeah. But I kind of knew like, okay, I know myself once I actually get building in the website, I'm going to have a lot of fun. And so if <laughs> I can just like get a rough, you know, a few things out there, then it's going to be fun. And I actually did that. And, and that's how awesome. it kind of turned out where I was like, okay, then there was a few weekends where I was just like looking forward to actually working on the website, seeing it come together. Yeah. And so by the end, I was like at this point before I committed to building out the website where I was, you know, it's getting into end of year time. Um, and I was thinking, you know, I think this is going to be the one big mistake of this year was taking on this project where I spent so much time on it. I spent several thousand dollars hiring people to do data business, stuff like that. I spent tons of time, uh, myself on this and I don't think it's going to be worth it. And then the funny thing is like, once I launched it, it kind of like checked all the boxes and did all the things that I, when I initially thought of it, that it would do, it did that. And I was like, wow, I'm like so glad I actually did push through it. And it it was this swing from like, this was a huge mistake, but maybe I'll just try and get it out anyway (laughs) to like, oh, this actually did all the stuff that I wanted to do in the first place. And now it's kind of set up this template to do it. uh, I'm crossing my fingers here, like much more quickly and efficiently next year. Yeah, absolutely, man. Three, Three lessons that I got from this. We overestimate what we can do in the short term, right? And we underestimate what we can do on the long term. Um, I feel like this is a challenge for most people, which is setting realistic timelines. I know I'm one of those. (laughs) Then the second lesson is just get started and build momentum, right? Because once Mm -hmm. you said, you know, I started doing this and then it became fun. It was a lot of, you know, once you started getting into it, it was easier to build. And sometimes that anxiety comes from just thinking way too much about the problem again i raised my hand myself right there and third is the first time you're gonna need to invest more resources into the activity because again you're starting from scratch but then that's going to hopefully set the foundation to do it repetitively on next time because you have processes you have again a template on how to lay this information etc so it's the same with with content right let's put it in the context of launching a podcast right again you Mm -hmm. might overestimate what you can do in the short term right and then you might plan for a certain thing in certain timeline and you know might take a little bit longer but at the end of the day you gotta push through it once you get started and you're having these conversations like the one we're having with jeremy you're gonna see how fun it is and you want to keep going keep interviewing people or doing your solo episodes and then last but not least once you start to repeatedly doing these episodes you're going to notice a pretty much a trend inside of how you run the podcast that you operated and it's just going to be easier and easier eventually allowing you to bring probably team members that can help you run parts of your podcast and you know making it more possible for you to launch more episodes I think one of the, the yeah. points there, Jeremy, that I resonate a ton with, and uh, and I think most people in the in the show might too, is like, we're also bi- business owners, right? We run the business, so there's a ton of stuff that happens 
behind the camera is not just the content, right? So mm-hmm. the content itself or like even doing a project like the one that you did, right, can can take some some capacity to do it the first time. But like I said, like if you think ahead and be like, this is something that I might want to do, you know, the next few years, then you can start building that initial framework and, the, and it will, you will help leverage that side. But on the drive here, I was listening actually to an interview with uh, Emma Cham- Chamberlain. Uh, Chamberlain? Chamberlain. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Do, do you know the, you know who she is? Yeah, the YouTuber. Yeah, yep. she has a coffee company too. And then... She hasn't been posting on YouTube. I think last year was three videos only, and she was some somebody that did daily vlogging, right, or weekly vlogging. Mm. It was like something very, very intense. And uh, she talks about the creative process, and uh, you know, a podcast or a platform or a project like that, it it takes that capacity. At the end of the day, she was not happy with the thing that she was creating, right? So I think that's an, a very important thing. And then uh, she she free herself from that belief, and she's like, you know what? I'm just gonna stop running this rat race of content or consistent stuff, or you know, because I don't like it anymore. And I'm just gonna shift to something that I do that that I do like at this moment in my life. And for her, it was a podcast, and then maybe three videos documenting these really big events that she did. Uh, and mm-hmm. we talk about this quite often with projects like that. Like, like for example, uh, I know that if I don't like that project, I probably won't put the effort that I need to put to to do the best thing possible to mm-hmm. do it, right? Like, different, we have a team or, you know, there's certain parts and certain levers that you can pull to make it happen if it does need to be happen. But, you know, for the last week or so, I personally been working on a, on a project that's like along the lines of what we want to do for the, the long term. And that fire kind of reignited a ton, right? And it's like, uh, it brings me to that. And then with content, I think people need to bring it down. Be like, okay, it, maybe podcasting doesn't excite you. Well, what does excite you? Because right now, every single company needs to create something. We highly recommend podcasting, obviously. So you can check Jeremy's mm-hmm. uh, not, not bias resources. at all. It's not bias. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but it, uh, we can do something that fulfills us. And for us, having these conversations and relationships is, is something. So uh, I okay. hope it ignites fire to somebody to do a, an amazing project like the yeah. one that you did. Absolutely. So let's dive, let's dive in into the goodness of this report, right? And, uh, you know, for people listening, we're going to go a little bit into what are Jeremy's top three lessons from putting this report together. Also, we're going to give you some action points on what to do to grow your podcast in 2024. And then as well, we're going to share a little bit of Jeremy's favorite marketing campaigns that he has seen because he knows a lot of podcasters he's worked with a lot of podcasting people and uh, i'm very curious i'm very curious to see you know not that i'm trying to write down in here all the secrets but <laughs> all right so let's start it jeremy with uh, what are your top three lessons that you got from putting this report together yeah i mean I, I think the first one the the real question behind the whole report for me was around that month over month or annual growth rate usually i track month over month and that's what I've always done for like email lists, social followings, all those types of things. And it just, to me, it makes the most sense. Uh, It kind of levels the playing field a little bit where it's hard to know, like, okay, if you're growing by a hundred downloads a month, like how does that, that's, you're not really, if you're looking at a show that already has 10,000 downloads a month, like a hundred downloads a month for them is almost nothing. Whereas if you're starting from like 10 downloads a month, it's like incredible growth. And so I think it kind of like going by a month over month growth rate is a better indicator of like how you're stacking up to other similar shows. And that does vary. Like it's easier for a small show to grow by a larger percentage. But um, that was kind of like one of my questions all the time. I kind of assumed that like from what I'd seen from clients, a kind of average 5% month over month growth rate was like pretty solid. Like if you were uh, in the five to 10% range, which is a lot of like what I've seen from newsletters and things like that as well. Yeah. Like you're doing pretty well. And one of the big surprises was that how much lower it actually was. Mm. And so keep in mind, like the, the survey data here is all active podcasters. So one of the things with a lot of the whole podcast industry surveys is that they count a lot of like dead shows essentially that haven't yeah. pu- published in years sometimes. And so this was interesting that this was like all shows that were actively publishing throughout the year. Um, and actually with this number, it was the full 12 months straight. They had 12 months of publishing data that they submitted and the average was only 1.6% per wow. month growth, which is like, mm. you start thinking about like, if you have a hundred downloads, uh, or let's, yeah, let's just say a hundred downloads an episode. Over, now the next month you're basically looking at like 101, which is like <laughs> such a, a small, but maybe it's a, you round up to 102, but it's like yeah. such a small amount. And of course that, that adds up to more listeners as you have a bigger show, but yeah. still it's a lot lower than people yeah. would think. And so that to me, the, the, the big takeaway is like, okay, podcasting as a medium is hard to grow. Like if that's the overall kind of median typical show that we're looking at here is only growing by 1.6% month over month, 
that's not a ton. Uh, and so I think that to me, I, like a lot of, uh, I think I got the, the report open here. And when I asked like people, what is the reason for your, you podcasting? 27% of people, this was tied for the, the most common answer was to grow my audience. Mm. And that to me suggests like there's a big disconnect here because like people start shows to grow their audience, but it's mm. just not a good platform for growing your audience. It's a fantastic platform for nurturing your audience and turning kind of attention that you're finding elsewhere into clients and customers. Yeah. But it's not, you know, there's everybody knows this in podcasting. There's not great discoverability right now. And so I think that yeah. was the one thing that was both disappointing, but also kind of encouraging for a lot of people who yeah. might be looking at their slow growth. And it's actually like, oh, this is totally normal. And it's not that shows, there aren't shows that grow much faster than that. Yeah. But by and large, you know, that's kind of what maybe you should build your expectations around. Uh, I, yeah, I, I love this, especially like now with the studio, we have so many of these conversations of people that want to get into the industry, right? and they might have a reference of maybe a YouTube show or something like more visual or more like, the entertaining side, right? And and then we're like, well, what's the topic? And it might be something that just the market itself might be super niche and it, it might not achieve those expectations. But now, even with this realistic data, right? Like, this is what you can expect, right? But guess what? There's all the vehicles that we can maybe present your content mm -hmm. to people inside of your company, to people that are already clients of, of yours, to people that, you know, can we involve them into the creation process so you can foster those relationships? And and I think it will ignite a lot more conversations for people to collaborate and, and, and take actually advantage of this incredible medium. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. the natural question that is going to come into most of the people that are listening to this is going to be, okay, 1%, pretty low. How do mm -hmm. I increase that? So we're going to go to your other two lessons from the report, and then we're going to cover that. Then we're going to go into a little bit of a, some action yeah. pointers in there to grow in 2024, hopefully beyond that 1% month over month. So what are the, the other two lessons? Yeah, so the the one, I think the, the third one I'll, I'll share here is kind of a, a two-parter, and that will lead into the next conversation. But the other thing that I was uh, kind of fascinated to find is that there was a, a full 30%, so like a third of the shows that submitted data actually shrunk in per episode downloads, which was, you know, you have to imagine that, yeah, of course, like some shows must shrink, but I, I think we all assume that like the only way to go is up. And like, I think a lot of podcasters have, you know, hit that plateau, but to see so many shows decline was really fascinating. And when you look at a lot of the data behind it, it's usually shows that are big. And so a lot of times they're shows that are old. So they've been around a long time. They are big shows that might have tens of thousands of downloads. They were big shows were way more likely to shrink than small shows, which kind of makes sense. Like yeah. they have uh, a show with 10 downloads an episode doesn't have that far that they can actually go. Whereas a show with 30,000 downloads an episode, like yeah. they, they could go up a lot, but they could also go down quite a bit too. Yeah. And so I thought that was really interesting. This, the other thing that was interesting about that was there's all kinds of nuance to it that you have to kind of tease out from the data. But what I saw with those, with a lot of the shows that shrunk on a per episode basis, they actually still grew on a total downloads basis. And the reason was that many big shows, because of the kind of like economic model that they're following, end up publishing a lot more episodes. And so it, it kind of makes sense that a show that had, you know, 20,000 downloads an episode, they used to publish once a week, they start publishing three times a week and they didn't all of a sudden like, get two times or three times more people it's like now the same they still have the same audience but their audience is maybe only listening to one or two episodes a week rather than all three so it's kind of pulling the average down and so i think like that was something that um i wanted to kind of put a point on with some of the data where it's like you could look at some of this stuff and be like oh the big shows are doing this so i should do that when you have to kind of realize they have a totally different business model than many small shows have. And it kind of demands that they put out as much content as possible. And it's not like they got big because they were publishing three episodes a week. It's because they kind of have to, if they want to keep the revenue coming in and get more ad space and things like that. And to some extent, it may actually be hurting their overall growth. Yeah, that is very interesting. And I'm curious, why do you think some of those shows are shrinking beyond the fact that uh, you know longevity and maybe people are like well this is the same as it was three years ago are there other reasons yeah i think so i mean on the on the per episode basis it's just i think they produce more episodes fewer people listen to all of them so that's i think a big one but other than that i especially with a lot of the shows being that that shrunk being older i think it's 
you just get stuck in whatever you were got successful with. You kind of like keep replicating that, but eventually trends change. And so that might not be the type of show that people are like new listeners are really into anymore. And maybe even yeah. existing listeners start to get tired of that. And so you're left with a lot of your super fans, but it's not really appealing to bringing in new people. And I think that this is just this like natural life cycle of any business, any content that as it ages, it gets harder and harder to stay relevant while also honoring all the people who've been there for a long time. And uh, I think this is one of the reasons why like a lot of, um, there's multiple reasons for this, but a lot of networks or successful shows will spin off new shows. And so instead of trying to reinvent the old show, they'll say, okay, we'll keep this going because we've got a good thing here, but we're actually going to start a brand new show and we can use our existing platform to kind of launch it and build that, that initial audience. But we're going to try a new format that's like feels fresher, more kind of like in line with what people are, are really wanting from podcasts now. And yeah. that's going to be its whole new show. Maybe it's the same host, maybe it's different hosts, whatever. Um, but I think that that uh, is what happens a lot yeah. of times. Yeah, that's such an important point here. Just just one second. It, I've, I've seen that a lot with like Wondery Networks, like Wondery, that they do this mm -hmm. very high quality podcast. And, you know, maybe they have some like business wars that has been running now for a while and it's absolutely amazing. But every season kind of has that element of novelty, right? Because they're picking mm -hmm. two new businesses, putting them against each other. But then you have series, right? And um, kind of like the Boonga Boonga, right? That was more of, of like a limited story about one person. Mm -hmm. oh, that was so good. And then they use that to promote their app and other shows inside of the network. So they're kind of like, what I'm imagining is like a chunk of listeners that they go jumping from one another. And as they're jumping to one another, they're kind of like dragging new listeners and collectively mm -hmm. they're, they're growing. I think that's, yeah. that's, that's a key point. And for the independent podcaster, right. Or the business podcaster, I would challenge you to think on like, how can you potentially maybe include that element into your podcast? Right. Can you have seasons? How can you include the element of novelty? Right. Can you make mm -hmm. it rather than just an interview? Can you do like a little bit of a talk show, right? Can you have the spinning wheel with prices and chances? I don't know. Like, <laughs> can we do something different? I think yeah. it's a it's a fun question to to ponder about. Yeah, and I think maybe like that conversation is a little bit harder to have when you have like a long format show where people are investing mm -hmm. a lot of resources right into this. Like they might be thinking like, I mean, we've mm -hmm. sat down a few times and we've, you know, drama about like, what's the evolution of content's profit or mm -hmm. the two brothers show, or, you know, the soccer show that we want to like, there's all these spinoffs like within the network that brings out maybe your personality or a way to look at things. Uh, maybe it's not us hosting, but it's somebody that, you know, we admire and that we want to have him in, in part of the network. And, you know, it's part of our roadmap internally, like as a, as a, as a company to start doing that. And mm -hmm. I remember when I first started listening NPR, like this was like five years ago. It wasn't it podcasting wasn't even like a thing uh, in my head, right? It was like this thing that I had to listen while driving to training soccer mm -hmm. kids. And uh, Planet Money was one of my favorite shows that I would listen. And then they they did the launch of the indicator. And the difference mm -hmm. was Planet Money was about thirty minute show documenting like an experience and and these like trends. And then the indicator was the concept was we're gonna debrief like this one number of things that are happening. Yeah. So, you know, inflation goes up 9%, for, for example, then they will do that for like 10 minutes. And it was like a very small show. And then both of them still exist today, but then they've also released along that line of thoughts, like different things. So it's like this subsex, um, of, of content and we've we see that a lot with micro content right like with people on TikTok yeah. on reels and different things that they have like these themes of clips that they do like interview clips or they do reaction clips and they do mm -hmm. you know uh behind the scenes stuff or they do voiceover over like somebody executing an action right so that's the way instead of that specific platform how to do that so the format is these different different things within the same you know, uh, framework, like how can you do that for podcasting? And I think that's an interesting challenge for a lot of companies because they mm -hmm. see this medium as like just one of those elements, but within that channel, you can do so much, right? You could have your internal podcast, you could have your outside marketing podcast, you could have a sales indoctrination side. Like there's all mm -hmm. these elements that a business today can take advantage uh, on this platform. Yeah, I think there's also an element in here of, you know, maybe more of a reminder <laughs> that a percentage of your content should be based on what's working and keep doing more of the thing that is working. And then another, maybe smaller percentage, keep it as a test, right? Like you have a hypothesis like, oh, maybe a series on, you know, content software is going to do great. And then we start doing that. And if enough, it doesn't perform, 
cool, we caught it and we go on to the next thing, but always be testing new things because one of those could explode and then lean into that one, put, put more resources into that. So Jeremy, yeah. what is the, the third one, the third uh, lesson here? Yeah, so this one was uh, a little bit interesting because I had my uh, expectation of how this would go. And with a lot of the, the numbers here, I was like expected one thing and either <laughs> it confirms it or it doesn't confirm it. And so this one had to do with, I was really curious about the budget differences. And so in this section, essentially in a lot of the report, there's two kind of cross analyses happening. So the first one is shows that are um, getting 10,000 or above downloads an episode, uh, 1,000 to 10,000 or less than 1,000. So the first part of the report is all like big versus small shows essentially. And then the second part of the report um, where there's a bunch of data was on the growth rate. And so like high growth shows that I think it was like more than doubled in the year. So they grew by 100% or more. And then there was um, shows from 21% to 100%. And so 21 was the like average growth rate. And so it's like shows that were better than average, but they didn't double in size. And then zero to 20%, which was kind of the like, okay, they did yeah. grow, but they grew less than the overall average. And then the shows that shrunk. And so I was really curious in this section to see like, okay, regardless of, of number of downloads per episode, like just talking about growth, like what are people doing here? And it was really fascinating where as you kind of like would expect to some extent, the highest growth shows or the shows that did double in size, um, in terms of budget, they spent more than any other category. And so I was looking at that and I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. It kind of affirms what a lot of people would think. Yeah. But what was really fascinating was that there was one show that they had a budget of the, for marketing and production, everything. I don't know how many episodes they did per month. It was $17,500 per uh, month. And so they basically dragged up the whole average of this category. <laughs> and if you look at, if you remove that show from that data set, that uh, group of, of high growth shows actually spent the least on their show, oh. which is just they kind said. of like mind boggling. Yeah. And it's like, oh, they, they spent less on production and marketing, like all of it combined. Interesting. And so I was thinking about this and the, it kind of paired with the second data point, which was around how much time these shows spent on their shows. And this one, it was, uh, there was no kind of uh, surprises here that the, the highest growth shows spent more time on both marketing and production than any other show, but it was a way slimmer margin than I was thinking. And so I was expecting that the high growth shows would spend like two or three times as much time on marketing as any of the other shows did. And it was very similar actually. So like all told, the weekly time investment for the high growth shows was just over 12 hours. And kind of the, the average for all shows was around 10 hours. So they spent an extra two hours a week or so um, on production and marketing. They spent maybe an extra half hour on marketing specifically than other shows. Yeah. So it's like, okay, that, you know, that there is something to be said for that. But I think combined, the what this kind of says to me, and there could be many interpretations to this, is that, okay, they didn't spend a ton more time on production or uh, marketing. And if we remove the one show, they actually spent less money on production and marketing. So like, why did these shows grow so much? And the, the only real explanation that makes sense to me is like, they just have better concepts. Like they are inherently more interesting shows that they don't actually take as much uh, money to you know, invest in advertising or anything like that. And also they, they don't, they get better returns on the time that's invested in them uh, than the other shows. And so, you know, that could be, I could be totally off base with that, but that yeah. based on the data that came out, I was like, this seems to be the most logical answer that like they get better results without really doing a whole lot more. It must be that it's a more interesting show or that feels like a plausible yeah. explanation. Yeah. Oh man. So good. So to, to rephrase this real quick to make sure I'm a, uh understand them properly and maybe help some of the listeners here as well. You're saying my, the resources invested into the podcast are not directly correlated to the growth rather than yeah. maybe the positioning, the idea uh, behind the podcast itself. How are you presenting yourself in front of a new audience that is influencing way more than actually you spending your, you know, resources into this. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. And I think like this is something that I 
I think the more and more people I work with, I've been, you know, working with people for years and years now on podcasting. And it's just like every new year, I'm just like, oh man, it's, it's so hard to fix things with marketing when you created a show that wasn't really interesting. And I think like people, you know, people don't like a lot of, a lot of people. So I love marketing. A lot of people don't want to spend their time marketing, especially their podcast. They're like, the podcast is supposed to be marketing for my business. And so I don't want to spend more time marketing the podcast to then get people into the business. And I think like the, what you realize is like, okay, if you want to spend less time marketing, then the only real way to do that is to like make a show or whatever your content is. That is just like really inherently compelling. Whereas like you just, get in front of people and people are like, Oh, I want that. That sounds like the show that I just like have to listen to it. Yeah. And I think when you don't have that, then you have to like push really hard and spend money and like just pound the pavement to like get people into it, which like is the last thing anybody wants. Yeah. I, you just hit the nail. Like I, that, that's one of the things I really wanted to comment. It's like, uh, a lot of people come with the perception that the podcast itself is a marketing vehicle for their company. And we got to understand mm-hmm. that the podcast or the piece of content that we're creating that on its own is a product that you do have to market as mm-hmm. well. Right. Yeah. Uh, so like by making that, you know, that distinction, di- distinction uh, is going to help a ton of people now to, to, to map it out and, and, and plan like what they want to produce. Right. We had that conversation early when we, as soon as we took over the studio, this group of people came on and they were, we had these conversations on the onboarding side of things and uh, we're going through their concept. And it was like an, um, it was a client that are the previous owner had and we were mm. supposed to start the production and they bring a proposal and they're like, Hey Luis, like I would love for you guys to do like a apples to apples comparison to this proposal. And I started looking mm. at it and it's a marketing proposal It's not a production proposal. Right. And, uh, and they put in like all the promotional like stuff in there, but then there was zero production things in the proposal right and i'm like well you guys are coming to the studio to actually produce the show so this has nothing to do with it this is what you need to pay to actually produce the show (laughs) and they were so shocked right they were like they thought like that was the thing it was like how many posts on website the blog the you Mm -hmm. know building the the site or doing the blogs and doing the things i'm like you get we have to understand that those are all puzzle pieces that are needed to promote what you guys are creating here and making Mm -hmm. that distinction is super important uh when we tackle to do this, right? And, and like you said, like better concepts. And, and and this is where like the creative part can be like really interesting, right? Because, you know, you look at like Dave Ramsey and what he has built with his network, right? And his show and all the clips that, you know, that come out, especially is like him roasting people that have not done like very well with the finances, right? And that, there's yeah. a reason that's that way, right? Because it creates like this, these hooks for then the rest of the content that then promotes yeah. the rest of his company. Yeah, th- this actually reminds me of, uh, something Ali Abdal comments on uh, on podcast, which is he puts an asymmetrical amount of effort into his content creation, meaning, you know, he doesn't put the same amount of effort on the intro, the middle, and the end of his videos, because when you see at the retention graph, most people listen to the beginning, right? So if you put mm-hmm. the most effort at the end of the video, not the most amount of people are going to watch that segment that you put the most effort in. So you want to put most of your effort where most people are going to see it, which in the podcasting case might be the, maybe the image, right? The artwork and the Mm -hmm. podcast description, maybe the podcast trailer as well, right? Like what are those places that you can invest a lot of your energy, resources, creativity to hook Mm -hmm. people right? With your concept, with your idea, right? How you are positioning yourself, your podcast. So then people, when they tune into that, they're like, Ooh, this sounds interesting. And then they go and dive deeper into your world. That's not to say you're not going to put any effort on what comes next. (laughs) Of course you need to. But again, I I think that's, that's very important. And I think that builds onto the next part of the conversation with what, which was, right? What are some of those actions that people can take to improve their podcast growth in 2024. So pretty much so far we have, you know, more intention, more energy, right? More resources into that front facing part of the podcast, right? Our work, mm-hmm. uh, I'm guessing title, uh, description, right? What is your value proposition to the listener? So what what other ways, and I know you have a framework for this, so you feel free to go mm-hmm. more in depth in this. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I would just first like reiterate what you just said, because I think I always think about it through the the process, almost like kind of conversion rate optimization. So if you you know do any of that with landing pages, things like that, it's like, OK, what are what can I do to get more people to click the button or buy the product or whatever it is? And in podcasting, it's like, OK, when how might somebody come across my show? Maybe they hear about it on another podcast or something like that. That's that's great if that's part of your process. But a lot of times a lot of people are spending you know, time and money on social media. And it's like, okay, what is the process here? Somebody needs to see maybe the preview link. So they see the cover art, they see the title. And, you know, most people who see that are not clicking through. So if we can raise the percentage of people who are clicking through when they come across the show, so that means the title has to hook them as both relevant to them. That's the first thing. I think like yeah. one of the biggest things that I have just, it's actually a pretty low bar is like making sure that from the title and cover art, people, your, your ideal listeners understand that this is at least for them. And so it doesn't need to be like this amazingly catchy title or something like that. It's like, if it, if they can see this and they're like, oh, this is a show designed for someone like me, like even if it's super plain language or something like that, they're gonna at least consider it. And yeah. so I think like that's the first thing yeah. Just thinking about, and okay, title This cover is also co considering that most social media consumers know what a podcast is, right? That's the other thing. Mm -hmm. It's like uh, there's a, pr a big percentage of content consumers that might not know what a podcast is or might not even have the podcast app on their phones, right? Uh, yeah. It's growing. It's like l people are learning a little bit more. It's becoming a little bit more mainstream, but this is also considering that. Yeah. I think the, the second thing then kind of building on that is like, Again, there's many ways people discover podcasts, but another big one is you search a keyword phrase in a podcast app and there's probably gonna be in most niches, 10, 20, 100 shows that are all somewhat related to your topic that come up there. And so then it's about like, okay, how do we stand out here? And sure, design is part of that, but I think that's where the concept becomes much more important. And that's not always super visible from the outside, like what the format of your show is and what makes it different from other shows. But yeah. I think that like, this is something that really shows that grow much more quickly and are much easier to market, have really interesting, unique concepts that other shows, it's, it's not just like an interview show where we interview successful people on this topic about how they did that. Like that's not really a concept there. I mean, it might've been at one point, but now that basically sounds like it's a done. million other shows. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and so it's like, how do we explore this topic in an interesting way that no other show has done yet? Yeah. I'm curious on, um, First of all, what are your thoughts on personality, right? We we say here often, personality is super important, right? I think is mm -hmm. one of the things that is not talked about that often, that much. Yeah. I feel like people might be a little bit afraid of offending others and saying them like, hey, look, you got a little bit of a bland personality or something. Uh, or maybe, you know, it's a, again, there's listeners for every type of personality as well. I do believe that. But I do think we believe here that personality is very important, right? At least... Us as consumers were very attracted to creators with, you know, cool personalities that have values. Mm -hmm. uh, they know what they stand for, right? They're, they're not afraid of expressing their mind. And What do you stand for, Fonzie? Uh, that's a conversation <laughs> for another day. Uh, but, you know, a lot of times, too, also, I see this podcast, like the John Doe show, for example, right? And I'm like, yep. who's John Doe? Like, I have mm -hmm. no idea. Like why would I click on this thing? I'm curious on on your thoughts on that. Like, how do you see personality uh, imbued into the, the podcast creation process, right? And also, yeah. how do you see it as using your name for, you know, that front-facing part of the podcast that requires a lot of effort? Yeah, I think there's there's two considerations when you're thinking about that. I think a lot of times this would maybe vary depending on the genre that you're in and what type of show you're in. I think a lot of people are looking to build a personal brand around their show and that's why they lead with their their photo on the cover and their name. And I think a lot of people don't think like, why would somebody listen to the show who doesn't know me? Um, because they won't. Like there, there's literally zero reason for anybody to listen to that show unless they know you if all they see is the John Doe show and your photo. Like there, we need to give them something more than that. And so yep. that is... I, I get that. And sometimes depending on your goal, if your big goal for the show is you're saying, okay, nobody knows me now, but I'm going to be doing this for, for 10 or 15 years. And I think, I don't know if you guys know Danny Miranda. Yep. He's a, I think a great example of this where he's just like, Hey, I'm, I'm in this for 
I'm playing this game for decades. And so he's got the Danny Miranda podcast yeah. and he's kind of like, you know, I'm, I'm in this for the long game and yeah, nobody knows me now, but I'm going to keep grinding away and doing a incredible show until people will know my name one day. And like, I want to have that personal brand association with it. And so I think you can choose to do that. And you just have to say then like, okay, if anybody's going to listen to the show, they're not going to come through search results or me coming up there. Like I'm going to have to find these people elsewhere. They're first going to have to get to know me on another platform for some, whatever it is that they are going to follow me for. And then they're going to find out about the podcast through me. So it's a bit of a longer game that you're taking people on. Um, and that's totally fine. It's just going to take a lot longer probably to, to build up the show. And yeah. so I kind of think about that as like, there's host led growth, whereas like people listen to the show because they like you and you're the gateway to the show or like show led growth where it's like, it's just an interesting show that the, you hear the concept. And you're like, you don't even care who hosts it. Anybody mm. could host it. And it's, and maybe they couldn't, but like when you just look at the, the concept, you're like, wow, that's an interesting show. Like yeah. I want to listen to it. And I think you can have both actually, like you can be an interesting person that people find you and you can also have an interesting show. Um, that's kind of the, you know, the best place to be in, but you can also do it in, in either direction. And so I think like you kind of want to know what is my, what's the game I'm playing here. Yeah. And then the second thing that I would add onto that in terms of personality is I think like it's, it's really imp to, to get the sense of the personality people need to listen to the show. So people aren't typically going to listen to the show, um, without, uh, in this case, like unless they already yeah. know you or something like that, or the show's interesting. But I think once people are in the host makes a huge difference in retention. And I think Absolutely. that this is something that, um, not doesn't get talked enough about and people don't think about it in terms of marketing. Like everybody thinks about like getting new people in, but they don't think about like once people are in, like, are they sticking around? And it, it's just really sad to me to think like you would just imagine a scenario where you get like a thousand new people a month listening to the show and you know, 900 of those never come back. They listen to like three minutes or one episode and they're gone. And it's just like, wow, you spend all this effort getting these thousand people in and you only are left with a hundred of them left. Like if you can improve the quality and the retention of the show, like you're going to get way more out of your marketing efforts and you could drastically accelerate your yeah, growth. Yeah, it's like, yeah. is the bucket leaky, right? Like we, we used to talk yeah. about this like all the time with the studios. It's like we used to have, you know, X amount of people coming in, but then if that percentage of, you know, they're not liking the classes, they're not liking the, the fitness, mm -hmm. you know, coach or whatever, there might be a reason. And I think that's a great, opportunity for you to learn you know more about your show and, and start you know patching those and, and and i think a lot of people might be scared to have those conversations right like uh as soon as mm -hmm. you see that you might perceive yourself as a creator that does it really really well maybe you're an expert in your field right and you know the topic but maybe that's not entertaining for people maybe people don't want to consume that information in that way and mm -hmm. uh i personally think a lot of people are scared to face that feedback and yep. uh and that's part of like why they and i've certainly been in that position where it's like man like this took us so much effort so much resources so many resources like we're consistent finally right like crap like am i actually that person that can actually go and, and look at this feedback and learn from it mm -hmm. and then continue to evolve right and that's i think as a creator a lot of people are faced with that um yep. For a business, you know, depends on like who's the face of it, but I, I think it's important to go and look at the at the information. Yeah, the um, yeah. this reminds me also of a comment that Shampuri made, uh, one of the co-hosts from My First Million. He mentioned that people will come to the podcast because of the topic, and mm -hmm. and they will stay because of you, right? And I I do agree. There are some podcasts that I listen to that. I don't really care who the host is, right? And you can tell they're a highly scripted show. Like it has a lot of, you know, effort in there. Um, I think the host might be maybe picked because they have a good voice. Who knows? But <laughs> yeah. the shows that are more conversational based, interview based, guess what? The personality is a huge, huge factor. And the ones that I've, I see myself coming back to are people that I'm drawn to, that I want to learn from. I like their personality. I like their jokes, whatever it is, right? So I, I, I do agree a lot on, uh, you know, putting this effort up front for, to position your podcast, get people to find you, but then your personality mm -hmm. has to captivate people somehow uh, or the way you're, you're leading the show, right? Now we recently had a review that they definitely didn't like us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, somebody didn't like us. We, it's okay. It's okay. We still got an episode. Three, we 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 have an episode ready for you. Yeah, we, we got an, <laughs> a, an episode pending on that. So, Jeremy, 
we we talked about improving podcast growth through putting this kind of like asymmetrical effort front. Any other things that people might consider to improving their growth on 2024? Yeah, I mean, I I think like the big problem with podcasting growth is friction. And so like getting people into the show. And so like we kind of talked about the cover art, title, description, all that kind of like first touch points that people have, that's going to reduce the friction that it takes to get somebody in. But I also like to think about like, how can we use other mediums that have less friction? And so like thinking about a lot of people I talk to, like they're out on social media, which is is great. It is a discovery platform in on many most social media platforms. And so they are getting more attention there than the show is probably getting on its own. But they're like trying to they're playing on hard mode where they're like trying to get this like really kind of like short attention spans that people have on social media and immediately turn that like send people to the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas for me, I'm thinking like, OK, how can we what's a lower friction next step for them? And so on the one hand, like probably if you're on social media, you're, you may be, I mean, a lot of people aren't actually playing whatever the game of the platform is to grow that platform. That's one way to do it. But I really like to think about email and especially for any business owner, like you should have email anyway. And so thinking about like, okay, I'm going to go out and get attention. It's way easier to get somebody to sign up to my newsletter or a lead magnet. That's something that you can like go. It takes like 30 seconds to like, oh, that sounds interesting. I'm going to go submit my email. And now I don't need to do anything else right now. I know it'll be waiting for me in my inbox whenever I'm back at my computer or whatnot, or next Wednesday when the newsletter comes out. And so then you can, you can do this many ways. What I like to think about is like, if you want to get really technical, then you can start to do some like listener segmentation or, or subscriber segmentation here, where it's like maybe in the welcome email, it's something like, you know, which of these is the biggest thing you're focused on right now? You've got, you know, three things related to your topic and they click one of those links. And then that triggers a follow-up email and says like, Hey, since you mentioned that you were interested in this, here are five episodes that you might find really valuable from our podcast. And so now you've both got like awareness of the show and you've also kind of curated this like handpicked list of shows that you know are relevant to that person, which then again, and lowers the friction that they're like, okay, oh, this show exists. And wow, these, this episode topic sounds like exactly what I needed right now. And so I think that it's, it feels like there's more steps in getting people to the podcast. It feels like the most direct method is like, Hey, I see someone on social media, go listen to the podcast. There's nothing in between, but I think it's actually, uh, oh, this is, I never thought about it this way. It feels like close, uh, in like one axis, but there's this like height level too, where it's like asking them to like jump up this mountain where instead you can get them to go up these stairs around the side. Oh, I got a, this is a great new a metaphor. Moment. Be like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> using this all the time now. Yeah, no, I, I love this. And this is one of the things that we like that is very present in our every, every day, right? People consume content in different ways, right? Like, and, and I, mm -hmm. you know, there's a, there's a stat or a post going out around there. It's like, people don't consume long form content, right? And you're like, well, actually they do. That's why Netflix and Hulu and all these like Disney Plus uh -huh. exists, right? You, you still consume long form content, right? But the issue yeah. is like short form, a, a short form content consumer, they're trained to look at 60 second clips, right? For example, right? The transition, like you said, is there's a lot of friction to go <laughs> from that. And they might not yeah. even know what a podcast is. Like for them, the perception of visual content is maybe I have a YouTube podcast, right? And a YouTube or a video podcast is very different than maybe a audio only podcast also. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we see it with, you know, my dad thinks that a podcast is something that I have no idea what it is, right? Like he, he sent us yeah. saying, you know, we're very proud of him, he's publishing, right? But the perception on the product is very different. So we have to clearly define, well, what is a podcast, right? Uh, or what is a video podcast? And then how do you promote that? And, and I think that education gap, you know, in the consumer uh, is very important to consider. And I love how you put it, like, what's the lower friction next step? Right, yeah. and uh, I highlight put it in bold here for us to <laughs> to go and revisit, right? Because it's so important, and some sometimes we don't we don't think about those things because maybe short form is very hot right now and is like attracting some eyes, right? It mm -hmm. might not be the best medium for you to actually promote the show. It might be able it might be able to achieve like brand awareness, right? Consistency mm -hmm. on other platforms, right? Be present in those platforms, but it might not specifically be the best to go do that. Like in, in our example, every time we go guest that's you know where we get the most amount of attention for a podcast right because podcast mm -hmm. listeners listens to podcast uh mm -hmm. so they immediately on their app they're like oh my gosh this is great like let me go check these guys out but then on social right you know you have the one percent you know transfer rate or nine percent transfer rate like you, you know we don't know yeah yeah so jeremy we have um i want to transition to the last question here but before that i'm so curious actually since we started talking about premises and hooks right how to present the show my mind went like huh how would jeremy 
percent content is profit based <laughs> on his experience you know that he's been on the show so you can riff whether it's good or bad it's all good you know i'm curious based on your perception and being on the show now a few times how do you think we should present this show to to listeners now that being said the artwork that we had right is this kind of like bright blue and orange it says content is profit mindset entrepreneurship and marketing and it has a flipped picture upside down picture of me and my brother kind of like pointing at the screen <laughs> uh yeah. when we did that we were like well this is different it'll catch people's attention it, it kind of like has worked for a little bit i think you know it does catches people's eyes like who are these weirdos that are upside down <laughs> Um, but if I'm being honest, I 100% believe that it can be way, way better and has a have a better premise, right? So I'm curious. In your eyes, uh, I'm going to put you 15 seconds on the clock. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I think your cover art is great. It definitely makes you look, it feels legitimate and professional. So I don't think there's any issues there. Title is also clear. And so pe people know what they're going to get with the show. I think if you're looking at the premise side of things, then, and well, and, and I mean, this is an interesting conversation because the point of your show is relationship building. It's not necessarily meant the primary purpose is to attract people out in the world. And so in that case, like I would perhaps not change anything. Hmm. If though you were saying like, okay, we're, the show is, is really purely about just attracting new people to the show. Then I, I would definitely look at shifting up the, pre the premise somehow and like, let's just like take your existing title here. Um, I would probably change it at some point if we're going to go with a different premise. But like one of the things that I find is really easy for juicy premises is just aiming really narrow. And usually it's like taking one question that you ask somewhere in your show and making the whole show just about that question. And you realize like there's almost, and you can do this. I, I put down a note and uh, I'll do a uh, newsletter about this at some point recently. Like there's this idea in software about like unbundling these like larger products. Whereas like mm -hmm. a new startup can take like this one thing that yeah. uh, maybe like Facebook or something has all these different features and they're just going to do one of those things really well and better than Facebook does. Yeah. And I've started to think about like that for podcasting too, where there, there may be a show you like on your topic where they have a bunch of questions and they have this like one standard question that they, they ask regularly. And it's like, what if we did a whole show where every episode just focused on that one question? And so hmm. with your show, I might look at the first thing that comes to mind. I really like narrow interviews where it's like you you actually get into the stories when you just focus on this really small kind of like pinhole almost that you just like yeah. view this whole world through this one narrow thing and so i would think about like okay what could we create a show around out uh, on every episode we interview somebody about their like most profitable piece of content like this, okay this is an interesting idea so like it, this probably means that you would need to get people who have large followings but it's like mm -hmm. okay what's the one piece of content that you posted that drove the most sales and it you it could be a sponsored post or it could be a one email sales email that you sent or this one instagram post that drove signups for something and i think like there's probably a lot of interesting stories that you could get into from yeah. um people who have like million dollar post down to like, Hey, this was the, the first thing that I did. It's my most profitable piece of content ever. It got me $5,000 in sales. And it's like, what's the story behind that thing? Yeah. And like, that's, you hear that and you're like, Oh, that's really interesting. Mm. I, think, I absolutely love that. I think you just gave us the plan for the next three years. Jeremy. <laughs> like, uh, well, you know, send, <laughs> send us the invoice. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> wait, there, there's something I do want to comment on. Uh, at the very beginning, you mentioned, you know, we have this platform mainly for the relationship building. Uh, and yes, we do. And it said, so maybe your goal is not to build an, an audience. This is where I see the value of still building an audience is because if mm -hmm. you get to build an audience, you get to potentially bring better guests on the show, right? Because you, you're delivering value to your guests coming here because obviously you are providing your platform, right? You're providing distribution as well. So if your audience grows, there's more for the guests, more incentive for the guests to come to the show. Mm -hmm. So therefore, I think, you know, they're kind of like intertwined a little bit. Yes, you can yeah. have one where you don't really care that much on the audience. And I think maybe the first couple of years that was a little bit of or point. It was like, you know, let's not look at this to not get discouraged at all. Let's just 
focus on building relationships. Once we started, once we joined HubSpot, right, I mean, and the, the HubSpot pre- podcast the, the network. Pr- the premise was really that the fastest, fast, the fastest path to cash because we mm-hmm. we did have a business. Yeah. We had to feed our, you know, the families and so on and, and grow. But yep. then when we got to a point where HubSpot came in. Yeah, HubSpot came in. So we decided. shifted. Yeah, and yeah. we decided, okay, well, we got to grow the audience a little bit and then also we see the relationship between audience and better guests right so you get mm-hmm. to build better relationships you know get to tap into now new more powerful quote unquote networks you know uh yeah. and and i think it's a it's a win-win situation for everybody right it's a win obviously for you as a creator because you're bi- you know bringing awesome guests like jeremy right here it's a win for the guests because now you're exposing them to a whole new audience and it's a win for the audience because they get new quality conversations that they get to listen with incredible guests yeah yeah fancy good yeah. job jeremy Just this, this, was, this was so cool man we <laughs> go hang out in barcelona uh, <laughs> uh that's, that's where you are now but and uh, and i think you did an incredible job with this report thank you for breaking it down with us i think yeah. it's so interesting uh like you mentioned at the beginning like there's all these other reports that are more like industry reports in general like for mm-hmm. people that are outside of podcasting uh they're like oh this is interesting and uh, but then once you once you're in here right actually create and be like how do we actually you know uh you know take advantage of this incredible medium yeah. apart from their relationships and, and start learning about, uh, more about it right like and uh and it's funny because we go to all these events and the conversation revolves around that and you're like and we don't really seem to actually find the answer to the questions that we're trying to ask like you go to this presentation yeah. and it's everything is like it, it looks like there's like a paywall right <laughs> in front of our right. eyes. We're like, but no, but really tell me the thing. So uh, I think your report does a really good job at, you know, digging deep uh, and a lot of people should go download it. So I'm sure <laughs> we're going to put the, the link yeah. right below. Link in the bio, in the bio, link in the description. <laughs> link in the description. Yeah. So I'm, I'm too used now to creating reels <laughs> and stuff like that. Link in bio. Um, Jeremy, well, I wanted to dive into. It. I said it was going to be a short interview, and now we're we're been going for an hour here. I don't want to take too much more of your you time. You know what time is in Barcelona, man? I know. I, I know. also Barcelona. Oh, true. I Spain. forgot. I forget. This is like six, seven <laughs> hours ahead of us. So, all right, to wrap it up, because we already asked you in previous episodes, kind of like the question that we ask everybody. But I'm curious on what have been some of the most either creative or best, you know, marketing efforts that you've seen some podcasters do. Uh, and let's actually let's rephrase this. What are some of the best marketing uh, strategies that you've seen on podcasters that have increased a month over month growth rate that we were talking at the beginning that you're pretty much using as, you know, that standard to measure some sort of the success of this podcast? Right. So what are some of those strategies that rather bring in that one percent that you find out most podcasters have? And they can increase that to five, ten percent. Hopefully, who knows? Maybe, maybe a hundred percent. You go from one <laughs> listener to two listeners. One hundred percent growth. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think there's. You mentioned podcast guesting before. The, the two things that come up again and again and again are podcast guesting and cross promotions and collaborations. And so I think that those they're guesting is getting harder. There's more like competition in terms of like hosts get pitched a lot. Collaborations with other shows in your space or in adjacent adjacent spaces are often a really easy pitch. And so like, this is something that networks do all the time and you can set it up for yourself as well pretty easily. And most it's, it's a clear win-win if you're like targeting correctly. And so those can work really well with somewhat minimal effort. You need to kind of like make your list of people and do a bit of research, write your pitches, but it's not as hard a sell necessarily as doing a like guesting on a show where people are screening for content quality and like, are you legit? And like, yeah, they're probably not going to shout out your show on theirs without doing a bit of background check. But if you can like prove that you're, you know, legitimate and have some credibility, it should be pretty easy. So that's like the, the low hanging fruit that I think is accessible to everyone. It's free, takes a bit of time to do, but it can lead to significant growth. And I think, especially like you mentioned before, um, where, like podcast listeners listen to other podcasts. And so like, that's going to be everybody that you're getting in front of there is aware of podcasts and listens to podcasts already. So you're kind of removing one potential source of, of friction there. That's all we so, call smooth operator. That's what you call that. <laughs> you call that. <laughs> I love it. Jeremy, that's awesome. Uh, yeah, man, the, honestly, it's so cool. Like what a good roadmap for people to, you know, tackle content. And this applies for every single platform, right? Same thing. Like, if you are creating reels, how can you collaborate inside of reels? It's like with other people that actually consume reels and, mm-hmm. and do that kind of stuff, right? Like YouTube, same thing. 
Uh, but obviously we're very biased in podcasting because he has changed our lives and many other people. So um, if you are looking for a guesting solution, we do have a solution. So just send us a DM. It's actually really cool. We started using it and uh, super, super awesome for you to get super on other awesome. shows. Or super duper you. awesome. Pro trip, <laughs> pro, pro tip. If you want for that cross promo, like before you even pitch, have him on your show. Have him experience your mm -hmm. your podcast, your conversations, right? You're gonna be be able to build that relationship way faster, and uh, then that ask becomes like very very easy. Yeah, Jeremy, cool. man, thank you so much. This has been absolutely amazing. I'm thinking here we're gonna have to bring you every end of year to discuss <laughs> this. You know, the following podcast marketing trends. Uh, I'm already committing you to do the next one. So, you know, you better have it next year. I'm already committed myself. Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. Let's go. Uh, we, we're going to have to do one episode, which is the, what is the most profitable content piece that you've ever done uh, based on your feedback. Yes, so, yes. That is go. so good. That's so good. Jeremy, thank you so much. Anything else you want to share before you head out? No, I, I don't know if we mentioned the link, but it's at podcastmarketingtrends.com. Uh, so easy to find. And uh, it's totally, you don't need to even sign up for anything. It's ungated. And so you can access the full report there. And uh, <laughs> if anybody goes through and takes any insights away from it, would love to hear from you. Yes, That's awesome. And I, I, you know, you said it is uh, free. People can go in and ungate it. But I will encourage people to sign up to your newsletter because it's absolutely amazing. You're on it. You're consistent. Um, and it's, it's always valuable. Right, I think uh, Scrappy, right? The Scrappy Newsletter. Um, yeah, the Scrappy Podcasting Newsletter, yep. Scrappy Podcasting Newsletter, guys. We're going to leave the link in the description below, so make sure you scroll down, tap on that, and sign up and support Jeremy. Listen to everything he has to say because he lives and breathes this data. Like, he is in <laughs> it all the time. Jeremy, thank you so much. I appreciate you, and we'll see you probably on the next live event. Yeah, you're everywhere. So we'll see you, we'll see you next time. <laughs> With that awesome. said, guys. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Absolutely. <laughs> With that said, thank... Oh, no, not that one. Thank you so much for tuning to the Contest Profit Podcast. Go ahead and follow the show in your favorite podcasting platform and on social media at Beast Co. That is right. If Jeremy here to help you move one step closer towards your goal, please don't forget to share this episode and, and leave a five-star review. See ya. Bye, guys.